Now, um, I'm going to use a story here for starters on this one. Um, you can have a read through the bullet points there, but I, I'm not one bit um, shy to admit that I did have to call a lifeboat a number of years back. Uh, it's probably about seven or eight years ago now. And I know I did a lot of things very well that day, but I did make one mistake around my phone and I've never forgotten it since. So basically I had a group out on a very nice day and um, they were relatively inexperienced, but they'd done well in the free few days with me beforehand. But we went a little bit further because there was something that they really wanted to see down the coastline, but some breeze uh, came along and then one person got tired and capsized, then they capsized two or three times more. That spooked the rest of the people in the group. So my gut feeling told me straight away, this is going to be beyond my skill set. So immediately I raft them all together, put my tow line on, kept that raft pointing into the wind and pulled out my phone to ring the local lifeboat coxswain. So um, the difficulty was I had an iPhone in a case. It doesn't work that well when your fingers are wet and then it doesn't work at all well if you've got a six digit pin code to unlock it, let alone go down through your list of contacts and find the person that you need to speak to urgently. So um, I would really encourage you that your phone goes into a waterproof aqua pack case like this and that it's hung around your neck and tucked inside your buoyancy aid. All right. And there's no point in having it in a dry bag on your kayak or on the back deck of it, because if you get separated from that, it's your one chance of rescue potentially gone. And um, so that's why I sometimes advise people um, don't put the pin code on for starters and maybe take it a step further. Get an old Nokia push button phone, make sure it's reliable and use that as your kayaking phone. For the sake of a, a few euros, put some credit on it. You can put in your key numbers that you might need and it just means on the water then you're going to be able to use that phone a lot quicker and faster. Now some will argue that they bring their phone these days uh, to take the photographs on the trip so uh, you know, I, I won't tell you one way or another, but give it some thought. Um, now, in times gone by, mobile phones would have had a lot of signal issues around the coastline. But uh, let me tell you, uh, from my trip of kayaking around Ireland, uh, there was very rarely a time where we couldn't get signal on the Irish coastline. So it's, it's actually quite reliable now. So uh, that's a good thing. Um, but let me emphasize to you as well, another brief story. I was training a German man to sail kayak from Kinsale back to Germany a few years ago. I know it sounds crazy, doesn't it? Um, but he couldn't navigate. And he tried to convince me that, ah, oh, it's okay, John, I will use my, my iPhone and my iPad and I can navigate using that and Google Maps. And I told him quite, quite straight that he was crazy. And he was prepared to rely on his phone and his iPads alone to navigate with or to communicate with. Uh, that could be a potentially fatal mistake. So that's why we need to think about raising the alarm in different ways if we do get into difficulty. So um, some of you may have seen a recent video that I uh, produced. Um, I'm very passionate about trying to educate people on the use of PLBs. And the reason for that, folks, is I've seen a lot of situations go wrong in the water and I've been involved in quite a few rescues recently with the RNLI. And a lot of time can be wasted fidgeting around with an unreliable VHF signal, patchy phone signal, or, or maybe no communications at all, maybe not having any flares. The great thing about the PLB is it's a guaranteed rescue. So I won't go on about it too long tonight, but I'll give you the link afterwards for my PLB video and it'll go into a bit more detail. So just in short, a PLB is going to cost you around about 220 euros. It's got a seven year battery life. There's very little user familiarity required. You make sure that it's clipped to your buoyancy aid and in your pocket. Um, if for any reason out on the water things begin to go wrong, activate it early. You just flip back the, the front uh, kind of door in it. There's a little switch. You hold it down for three to five seconds. You can pull out a small little mini aerial from the top. And even though you might not be able to talk by phone or VHF to the Coast Guard, they will know exactly where you are based on the GPS satellite signal that that PLB is emitting. 
Now, when you buy it, you have a little bit of work to do. You go on to the Comreg website here in Ireland and you register your PLB to yourself. So you put down John Hines, your phone number, your email address, and you can put down a next, next of kin or wh whatever details you want to. And that can notify people if you do activate your PLB. So it means then in Valencia, Malinhead, or Dublin Coast Guard um, stations, if they get a PLB signal, they can uniquely identify that to you and immediately launch a rescue. Now, the great thing about it as well is because it's a live broadcast of your position, from whence you activate it, let's say you blow a, few, uh, a further two kilometers down the coastline while help is on its way, the lifeboat or the helicopter, whatever the case may be, can get a live feed of your current position. So the, it minimizes the amount of searching that has to be done for you. And that's important in terms of time, particularly in winter, because if you're in the water and it's cold and you're beginning to develop hypothermia, time is of the essence. Now, bottom right hand corner there, I have a photograph of a, a kayaker using a VHF radio handheld one. Um, so there, there's quite a bit of debate about the, the VHF scene here in Ireland. Uh, they're quite easy to use. You can get a certified training course and get a license from the Department of Transport to own and operate uh, a radio, although that's not legally mandatory. You can just go in and buy a VHF yourself and have a go at it, but that's not really advised. So um, we are working on trying to develop a kind of a, a, a short course uh, to train people on the use of handheld VHFs. So more about that in the questions if you want. Okay, we better move on folks. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about your safety pack now. So a few essentials there. Uh, kayaking in Ireland is a hypothermic potential sport 365 days a year. Even though you might be out on the nicest day in July or August, if someone falls into the water, it is only a matter of time before their core temperature begins to drop. And once that happens, your ability to function properly uh, dramatically reduces. So um, aside from dressing properly, we need to have some stuff in our safety pack to deal with that. So um, you might be familiar with the plastic bivy bags. They do a certain amount of good, but spend the extra couple of euros. I think it's about 12 to 15 to get a proper foil one. And uh, from my work with, as a wilderness DMT, um, I can really vouch for how effective they are at helping uh, maintain someone's heat. Um, in your bag as well, you should have a spare hat and gloves and some spare warm clothes. Um, if you had to land in an emergency on some shoreline, if somebody got cold, you may want to cover them up very quickly with some extra gear. Maybe think about some running repairs as well. Sit on top, kayaks are notorious for, <laughs> for losing their drain bungs. Um, so you can buy a couple of spare ones, have them in your safety kit. Maybe a waterproof tape that works on that or, or any other repair items that you might deem necessary for it. Um, I'm also going to advocate uh, carrying a basic first aid kit. Now, with that, you're going to need some training as well. And, you know, that can be a tall order for someone to, to go and spend money on a course when they've already, you know, spent quite a lot on their kayaking kit and the transport and all that. So um, I would advise you, uh, you can you know, get at some training quite easily with your local uh, Order of Malta or Red Cross, or indeed you could take it a step further and take a rescue and emergency care first aid course. And what's really important about that training is that you keep it maintained afterwards, because a lot of studies have shown that after six weeks, you'll have a lot of skill fade and forget some of those things. So just stay in tune with your first aid, and in particular, recognizing the signs and symptoms of hypothermia and also basic CPR processes. Now, I'm also going to recommend carrying some glow light sticks. So we spoke a lot about high-vis tape earlier. Um, so the, the glow light sticks are really effective. Um, you're probably familiar from seeing them at Electric Picnic or lots of other concerts like that. But when you get them in the little pack, you open it up, it comes with a length of string on it. And not many people actually know what that's for, but if you tie the glow stick onto the end of the string and spin it in a circular motion, you can kind of make a really big uh, disc of light that's visible from a long way off. So in sea kayaking, um, 
survival courses that I teach, we, we kind of regularly practice that skill um, and, and actually practice doing it while we're swimming in the sea at night. Um, so if you do happen to get caught out after dark, it's an essential piece of kit and they're only three or four euros each. Now, those of you that are into cam craft, um, you may even carry some fire making kit with you as well. Some kindling, fire lighter, matches or a lighter. Again, if you had to land somewhere inhospitable, maybe you might find some driftwood or something like that. You could raise the alarm using a, a fire on the shore. Um, I'm also going to mention briefly just uh, flares here as well. Now, we could have a long debate about this particular one. Um, again, there's a lot of risk in using pyrotechnic flares because they are effectively rockets and they burn at an incredibly high temperature. And unless you're trained and familiar with how they operate, you could end up doing more harm than good in some ways with a, a pyrotechnic flare. Um, you'll notice in the photograph there, that particular gentleman is using um, a smoke flare. So that's only really for usage when emergency services are close by for them to home in on your position. And it is also worth, worth mentioning before I finish this slide, that now you can buy um, LED or digital flares. Um, so many of the marine suppliers here in Ireland are really pushing that and they're a brilliant product. Um, I've tested them at night and we've got five nautical miles of visibility off those. So uh, maybe have a look at that after the call tonight.